So if you navigate while we're going, mm -hmm. then I'm, we can just start talking. Take a left out of here. Okay. Yeah. So John, welcome to uh, this next episode of what is this? The Innovation Lab. Innovation Lab. That's right. Yeah. Get confused. John, it's, it's nice to meet you. Uh, we haven't met before, and I, I kind of like it that way. So we can. This is a fresh conversation, if you will. And uh, I'd love, love to learn a little nice, bit. That's fine. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'd love to uh, learn about your background. And, and uh, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, you can take a take right, right here. here. And, and for quick background, before you do, John, you're on. Um, and so the, so the folks know what's going on here. Uh, Jeff and I are driving around, uh, as a, which I think is going to be obvious if, if, if all the equipment's working here. John's on uh, what, Teams or That's Zoom right. or whatever. He can't see us. We can't see him. But it's just like a conversation in the car. John, it would be better if you were in the back seat here. But uh, <laughs> maybe next time. Sorry. Okay. So go ahead. Tell us. Tell us about you. Who are you? Yeah. Well, uh, I've been a patent attorney for uh, about 30 years. And along the the, uh, the career path, I ended up being an entrepreneur and, and selling inventions to a few different companies and starting up a couple of companies. Uh, right now, I'm the CEO of a company called Diagmetrics, and we've been developing a mass-based diagnostic. Started with uh, COVID testing, and now we're we're looking at other use cases as well. And your name is John Daniels, yes? It sure is John Daniels, yes. Okay, all right. Well, we'll get that. We'll get that in the show notes. So, so that's fascinating, John. Thank you for uh, for sharing that with us. So. When you say diagnostic face mask, are you talking about for things like um, sleep apnea or obstructive sleep apnea? No, not not uh, for those use cases. It's really the convenience of putting a mask on as the uh, as the form factor, and it's for pathogen diagnostics and for uh, diagnosing and looking for target biomarkers for other diseases besides viruses and uh, bacterial infections. But our, our first use case is for COVID-19. Uh, we've been developing it with funding from uh, the NIH's RADx program, specifically for uh, accessibility market for people with low vision and no vision, blind people and the elderly. They, they were uh, very underserved. There, there aren't really tests that are available uh, for people with uh, disabilities. And the RADx program asked us to see if we can to reconfigure our diagnostic for those target users, and uh, so far we've been very successful in, in achieving that. What is the mask? Uh, what is the mask like? I mean, just so people have a, a picture of it, if you will. Yeah, it, it, it's just like a conventional face mask. It's uh, uh, there's only a few styles of masks, really. This one's called a duckbill mask, so it looks like you're you're wearing a, a duckbill. It's a, a triangular shaped mask, and it can really be any configuration. The, the idea of the mask is just to hold the exhaled breath uh, in a contained volume so that we can condense it down and, and turn it into a liquid, a biosample of the exhaled breath condensate, and it's that condensate that we test with our biosensor. And it looks like it just everything quick... self-contained. It's just quickly. And before you get further into it, just uh, and then Jeff's got questions. Um, yeah. It looks like a, a COVID mask. It looks like one of the one yeah. of the screwier COVID masks. It doesn't look like the kind that the surgeon would wear. It looks like the kind of sort of geeky ones that the nerds would wear, <clears throat> like Jeff and I. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's exactly it. That's that's fascinating. So, uh, so John, what I mean. I, I get uh, the, the request from Radex and, and uh, NIH certainly makes sense. Um, what, why the, why the mask form factor? Well, it's, it's really the convenience of being able to uh, get a bio sample non-invasively from the body. That's what the genesis of the, sure. of the idea really was to uh, avoid things like nasal swabs. And, and as it evolved, it just became really simpler and simpler. So it's a very easy device. Uh, to put on, and then all the user has to do is just breathe. For how long? And everything else is done by the mask. For how long? Uh, why, about why? five minutes to complete the test. Five minutes. So, yeah. so yeah. So, I've played a little in the breath condensate space, and and uh, obviously the challenges with breath condensate is the, some of the moisture, and you know, using that moisture sounds like part of part of your uh, secret sauce there. Um, you know. What um, what's what's your first indication that you're going after? Uh, you said COVID nineteen, right? Is there is there something after this pandemic that's going to pick up where that kind of leaves off? 
Yeah, there sure is. We've got interest uh, in Europe and, and here in the U.S. on uh, tuberculosis, uh, naturally a, a next use case for us. Wow. And uh, we just had a meeting today with a group that's interested in exploring a collaborative opportunity for lung cancer screening. So, t- so tell me, can um, is tuberculosis, uh, I, I know um, somebody I know is getting a test right now, a skin test. It's one of those, uh, I guess they're all the so-called, so-called slow tests what, 48-hour skin test. Mm. Is tuberculosis expelled right. through the um, through the breath that is in some particular form in any concentration of interest? Yeah, it is. A, yeah, it, it is. And uh, we are, we've yet to demonstrate the, the concentration uh, of the bacteria that's in the exhaled breath is, uh, is enough for our limit of detection, but we've got a very sensitive uh, biosensor, so we're, we're confident that it will be uh, but no one has done this before. So the idea is really to, mm. to take that same breath that now may be infecting another person. So obviously it's containing the microorganism if it's infectious and cool it down so that we can uh, obtain, actually the, it's the protein that we're looking for uh, of the cell wall of the uh, bacteria that is our target that we look for with our biosensor. And is but that the, the exhaled breath? Uh, is, is that the, um, yeah, go I don't I, I gather <laughs> tuberculosis is contagious. So that's what I hear. <laughs> um, I think that's why they have the sanitarium. Yeah, it's <laughs> As we sit in a confined space, <laughs> laughing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't get, so, not, okay. not paranoid at all. What are you talking about? <laughs> so it's contagious. <laughs> is the thing that you're picking up, the cell wall, the proteins from the cell wall, indeed the thing that is contagious or is it some other byproduct of the of the life cycle of the uh, bacteria or virus uh and which is it by the way in the body and then particularly in the lungs yeah yeah it, it's, it's a virus uh, it's a bacteria it's not a virus and it, it is the virus that you uh get infected from i'm sorry the bacteria that bacteria. you get infected oh. from we're looking f- yeah but you're the, not the live up- bacteria is infectious but you're picking up the pro. I'm sorry. So do you know the answer to this? He, he's picking up proteins. Yep. And proteins are different than proteins. Could we all sort of shed proteins during the day? Hair, I think, is protein. Yep. Um, but hair isn't particularly infectious. Um, I think so, he's talking about the bacterial cell wall, right? So, so is the cell wall infectious, or do you need? I would think you'd need to be infectious. I would think you'd need uh, something that can reproduce. So I'm sorry. Maybe I'm. Maybe I. I, I did okay and high school biology um but what is it they what is it that's reproduced that that is infectious is that too detailed a question yeah it it is it's the no no it's a a simple and good question it's the bacteria that is infectious or or that you get infected from it's the cell wall or or specifically a protein called uh the acronym is lam l-a-m the cell wall is made up of proteins one of the proteins is called LAM, L-A-M, it's you know, short for a very long, uh, hard to pronounce word, but it's that protein that we target as our biomarker. Well, we have so pre- the, the pre- protein is obviously oh, yeah. part of... Go ahead. Yeah. Jeff's got a brilliant question. No, no, I was uh, just going to say... say that Go, ahead. Go ahead, John. Well, I, I was going to finish, finish the answer for Dave's question on, on what's infectious. It, it's the bacteria that infects you it's the cell wall protein that we look for, but got obviously yep, yep, you've got, got the it. organism in you, it's got its cell wall, and that's what we look for. Perfect. Right. Very interesting. Yeah. One, number one, thank you for dumbing it down for us, and number two... <laughs> for, and, for and, Dave, yeah, for yeah. Dave. And, and, and thank you, <laughs> thank you for, um, for the encouragement. That, that also goes a long way, so appreciate that from our guests. But, um, so this is, this is fascinating. How long have you been working on this, John? since 2020 so just at the beginning of the pandemic uh it was actually it's a little bit of an interesting story i i had my uh, father was uh really on his deathbed in florida uh first one of the first people in fact he was the first person on on the west coast of florida to be admitted to one of the hospitals there with the uh with covid yeah he was really sick uh you know my mother obviously but it was just the two of them down there and she said, you know, he's, he's not looking good. I can't get him to get out of bed, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this was just when they were, uh, you know, really unknown what we needed to do to protect people and 
and there was uh, literally nobody on the airplane with me on, on the flight down from Connecticut. And when I got there, my father was indeed very sick. Uh, I got there late at night. In the morning, I brought him to the hospital, and they had just started setting up the protocol. So uh, they they put him into a wheelchair, and then they just took him away, and they wouldn't let let me go in. It was just you know it was just all of a sudden a and a complete transition from me oh, pushing God. my father around, walking my father around, getting pushed in a wheelchair to, to having them take me and pushing me aside, saying nobody can come into the hospital. This is, you know, this is a unknown uh, situation. Make a long story short, he he uh, made it through. He he was released as soon as they could because oh, thank the, God. Uh, by the time he was released, yeah yeah, by the time he was released from the hospital, the the. Uh, the hospital beds were already lining the the halls of oh the hospital. There weren't enough uh, rooms to take the people in, so it was just within days, you know, literally, it was the first one in, and then probably hours later, they started filling up. And of course, this is when there was no known, uh, not much known about the virus. Certainly, uh, not nothing known about things like uh, the the ventilator issues that they've had. And oh my God! I remember his doctor called me in the middle of the night and said, "You know, we we, we want to put your father on a ventilator. Oh. We need your permission." I said, "Well, Ouch. when when you're ready to do that, call me and we'll discuss it." Because you know, it was it was a drastic situation at yeah. that point. Yep. Uh, fortunately, they didn't put him on a ventilator. Oh, thank it turns God. Out you know, 80% of the people put on ventilators, right? It's really, yep, yep. really an interesting thing. Anyway, so that that became, uh, you know, I was there to, uh, taking care of them. My mother eventually uh, also had COVID. We kept her out of the hospital where doctors said, if you could keep her home, please do it. The hospital's no place for people with COVID. <laughs> no, <laughs> so, no, seriously. Yeah. So so she was, yeah, yeah, it was really, they, they really didn't know. It was, well, but make a, yeah, a long story, a little bit shorter. Uh, what was <laughs> yeah. astonishing to me was that there were no tests. You know, we, we really right. were flat footed uh, as the whole world was. But uh, in the U.S., you don't expect this. So I, I was very surprised that there there weren't tests available or that tests couldn't be spun up. And they were really fishing around for, for how to solve this problem. And that's where the, the genesis of the idea was, well, this is a respiratory disease. And if we can... Uh, if we can detect the, some biomarker in, in the exhaled breath, then uh, that would be a nice, convenient, easy way to to uh, to get, get testing going and and just started writing patents as quickly as I could on, on the ideas. Started fleshing those out until we had something that could be filed. Uh, fast forward a little bit, uh, met up with uh, my two co-founders, and we formed the company around this this basic idea. A couple of months later and uh, got in touch with a uh, husband and wife biosensor team that are in, in France uh, because that was one of the, the key components was, you know, now that we have figured out how to collect the exhale breath condensate, how do we test for it? And, you know, first looked in the literature and saw things like lateral flow acid, and, which are basically pregnancy tests. They're the, they're the uh, at-home tests that we're using now. Our, yep. our uh, device is called lateral flow assays, where you put the drop on and look for the change in color at the control and the test line. Started with that premise and then started learning more about these electronic biosensors. Found a, a, a paper that was very interesting and on point and contacted the uh, the author of the paper and, and uh, had a great conversation with him. And it turned out that he and his wife are, are both professors at the University of Lille in France, in Lille, France. And uh, they became part of our team. And, and that's sort of the core. So there's three of us in the U.S. and then two of us in, in France. And now we've expanded. I think we're up to about nine or ten uh, company team members all working on this project now. And, and again, the, the real... Uh, boost to us came when we were able to uh, get this uh, RADx grant because now we've got a very defined uh, direction for the technology and since this is all you know this this conversation has to do with innovation it really is I think a good segue into how a good idea needs to transition to a useful product if you're uh, doing anything other than you know the, the science for the sake of science it, productization is, is the key for making an innovation worthwhile. And this uh, RADx program really gave us that impetus. It, it also defined the target for us and, and gave us the resources so we can move very quickly. So now in the last six months, we've taken our technology, which was moving along very well, but uh, didn't have the, the boost that it got uh, 
in the last six months from this RADx program and just have advanced it extremely quickly to the point now where we're uh, really looking forward towards introducing the first product uh, within the next year or so. Um, you know, Okay, let me stars wow. keep aligning for us. There's always you something that, that could go wrong. Wow. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Yeah. No, that, that's impressive. I, I appreciate you uh, asking the questions for us and answering them too. But <laughs> that was good, John. That Thank was you very good. Me. Yeah, yeah. No, we're just we're just Remember, gonna send here. But, us, yeah, first, not you. <laughs> no, no. First of all. First of all, uh, thank you for sharing that. But you guys can just hang up. <laughs> yeah, we're, just, we're just driving around yeah. holding, holding hands here. Um, first of all, how is how is your dad doing? Well, uh, unfortunately, he ended up passing away uh, uh, last year in May. Uh, he was 94 years old. Wow. And, and that's not from COVID, although he, he had lingering effects, certainly. But uh, I mean, he just, you know, he, he, he reached the end of his life yep. just naturally. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad that uh, you, you got to you know, spend time with him after that. And it sounds like he was uh, tr one of the first, you know, patients to triumph over this. That That is a hard haul, especially when the doctors or stabbed in the dark to find, you know, a solution or how do they treat these patients? Um, but, but thank you for sharing that story. I'm sorry to hear about your dad's passing. Number two, um, uh, I've, I've reviewed so many RADx um, applications and through bar to drive program and things like that. But honestly, I've never heard of a, a diagnostic in that mask form factor. And I'm shocked when I, when you think about it, it, it seems so, um, Obvious. Uh, obvious now, but it's not no, obvious. It isn't, no. It's not obvious, and it, it is um, something that that I'm shocked we haven't seen before. Let right? me. Look, I have a question to yeah. tack onto that, Shoot. which goes right to it. So, John, and it actually what made me think about it is when you mentioned cancer, and I guess tuberculosis, but there are uh, dogs um, that can sniff can cancer. Sniff, yeah. sniff cancer. Yep. I presume they could train them to sniff tuberculosis as well, but yep. then they get tuberculosis and that's never any good. I don't but know they, if dogs can, is it, does it, does it cross it? You know, I don't know. Zoo, zoo, zoologic. Right. So, um, but in any case, you put the mask on for five minutes. Is that because <laughs> while I, this seems like a crazy question, a dog can smell cancer, presumably nearly immediately in yep. real time. Yeah because they they've got enough sensors built up sure but does john have the mask on for five minutes because he's essentially uh building up enough protein like the dog the dog senses immediately mm. john needs five minutes to sense is that mm. correct john so you need five minutes and potentially you can no, imagine go ahead go no i was going to say Dave, that's a, that's a really good analogy and a good point and it is because we need to build up the the condensate so first we have to cool the breath down get the droplets forming then the droplets flow what into can, a collection pool sense. so yeah, yeah. all of that takes time what, what can't the, you sense john john is, is, is very quick yeah, john, yeah. Well, it, just moving yeah. ahead to world domination because <laughs> i assume that's your goal um yeah. what of course are there any classes of conditions, uh, mm. probably negative conditions, yeah. that you that can't ultimately be sensed with enough time? Like, what, let's what, say, what is let's say, let's say well, di uh, diabetes and, and like, yeah. uh, you know, th things of that nature. Yeah, as a matter of fact, can you pick up DNA of your own? No, it's a great question. Yeah. Or, no, yes, could you? Could no. you no. It, it's a great question gotta, because yeah. it's... it's yeah. Girl, we're listening. Ignore us. <laughs> Okay. No, that's fine. Uh, I was going to say, it's, it's a great question because that's where we are as a company now is we're, we're looking at the next use space. The, the COVID market is is just very crowded. You know, all, all these companies that sprung out of nowhere and have got products on the market, uh, we're fortunate that we've got a, a niche product. So uh, that gets us a first product that we can enter the market with, with without much competition for the accessibility uh, end users. But for other use cases, we're, we're, we're exploring those right now, and tuberculosis is one of them, as I mentioned. But you know, conceivably, our biosensor, which is increasing in sensitivity very quickly, you know, that's sort of our frontier right now. Uh, with the right capture molecule, it's a capture molecule and semiconductor biosensor, I guess, pair. You can look at the, the pair of those uh, technologies uh, together. The capture molecule can be designed for just about any uh, electrical, I'm sorry, chemical uh, material. Okay, so let when me you ask. What else can you detect? Well, it, let me interrupt. Really, well, just to finish the thought, Dave, because it's the 
Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so let me ask Jeff and then get back to you. So, the famous company Theranos. Yeah. Or Theranos. Yeah, Theranos. Theranos. Yeah, yeah. So, the reason Theranos did so well, number one, it was uh, blood testing. Number two, there was the vision that you could do it in a single drop, which is a lot easier than collecting a small uh, sample. But that's not so much disease. I mean, it can sense disease, but it was more likely when you test blood, you're you're looking for overall chemical levels of the various components of blood, not just chemical levels, but that's the right. levels of various components. John probably can't do that, correct? John, you can't you can't ultimately sense what's in blood because blood's not ultimately exposed enough um, via the uh, respiratory uh, well, system. Yeah, correct. Is that correct, John? Well, no, not not for future. If we're looking towards the future, right now we're we're looking at exhale breath condensate. So of course the biomarker needs to be in the exhale breath condensate. Yep. And the reason it works so well with our system is we've got the the combination of a very clean bio sample, TBC exhale breath condensate is almost 100% water. So you have very few what's called confounding molecules. Blood is full of confounding molecules and cells and, and all kinds of things that are in blood. Uh, but uh, what we're seeing, and very encouragingly, is that the sensitivity of our biosensor is is very, uh, it, it just gets better. It's it just very sensitive now. It, it should get increasingly sensitive. It's also very selective, meaning that you don't pick up stray molecules and, and things that you're not targeting in, in your signal. So you get a very nice, clean signal, easy to detect because of that. So Theranos, I think, you know, they, they have they had a concept that did make sense. They probably didn't have a technology. Obviously, they didn't because of all the uh, the fallout from that. But the, in, in concept, you know, when you think about things, how small a molecule is compared to a drop of blood, there's a trillion molecules in that drop of blood. So there's, there's plenty of material to look for. The challenge is, is fishing through all of that material and finding the target that you're looking for. And, and that target needs to be in enough concentration that it, it sets off your uh, your level of detection. Exhaled breath condensate, again, is very clean. So that, that drop of exhaled breath condensate is gonna have fewer of those target molecules typically, but it's gonna also not have a lot of the confounding molecules in, involved as well. As we advance our technology, I think we're gonna see that we can do uh, biosensing with, with different uh, samples. So, so Dave, Dave just asked if we could do a, a mini seminar on yep. what RADx is, right? So RADx is a program, I believe it was uh, NIH BARDA um, collaboration, is that right? Oh, we lost him again. That's my understanding, yes. Oh. Yeah, so uh, during the pandemic, there was a budget that was set aside as emergency funding for searching for innovation, right? And so they reached out to a lot of uh, programs that BARDA and NIH already had um, relationships with, like UMass Lowell, for example, right? UMass Lowell was a RADx uh, partner, and um, they would ask individuals like myself on the business side, or their PhDs, or their scientists, and their uh, professors, and their, their academic teams to assess what we thought of the pipeline that was coming through their application process. And is BARDA an offshoot of BART, the uh, San Francisco uh, transit system? No, no, no. BARDA is uh, the biological and uh, uh, I don't I don't remember what the acronym stands but for. But what's, what's it a sub of, the NIH, or is it a uh, sub of It's kind of like DARPA. Else? It's kind of oh, like DARPA, DARPA, but it's for, oh. for biotech, right? Oh, so it's a new sub-agency. It is. It is not quite as new as uh, DARPA H, which yes. is the new health defense. Okay. Okay. Um, but it's a program for using public funding to innovate and vet new ideas. And what is at the top of it? Obviously the president, but through the uh, executive, so through the S Secretary of Defense? Yeah. John, part, you know? Part, partly. Do you know who sits at the top of it? I know that, well, here's here's the thing that I had a problem with RADx and the VARTA program going into the pandemic was because of the administration that was in charge, it was politicized. So um, if you couldn't give them a golden ticket before election day, if it wasn't gonna be ready for news and distribution before electric, election day, they didn't even consider it. Um, we can take it right. Meaning uh, we, had, we had companies that applied that we were uh, advocating for, that had the right stuff, that had promising uh, innovation, and they uh, got granted money and then they had a delay, and the delay was like two months that would put it past the November election, 
and they oh. nixed the program and made them pay every cent back or they would never get federal funding again. And this was the election of Biden? No, th yeah, this was the 2020 election. Um, okay. So if it wasn't ready before the 2020 election, it didn't exist. You mean the fake election that didn't occur? The one that was the one that was quote unquote stolen. Oh, right. <laughs> so, but it was, it was used as a political weapon. And what I was so proud of in that moment was that, um, oh, his name escapes me, but we can edit it in uh, post. Who is it? Um, Rick. Oh, what is not, not Admiral Rickover? No, no, not Admiral Rickover. His first name is Rick. He was a uh, he was the uh, secretary of or the director of BARDA at the time. Oh, okay. And he was a lifelong uh, biotech professional, brilliant scientist, pragmatic, uh, but but really running the the uh, the program well. We'll call him Rick. Bart Simpson. Sure, no, <laughs> but he he stood up to the president after oh, really? he resigned Man. because this the the program was so politicized and um, was one of the first ones in the administration to stand up and say no, this is not right, and uh, fought back against what was being done uh, in these government funded programs. So, John, as a Barda, you're not really a Barda consumer, but a Barta beneficiary, and keeping in mind they're probably going to watch this podcast, um, tell us all the good things you have to say about it. Yeah, well, first thing, this is enlightening what I just heard, and, and I <laughs> suspected as much because we saw a lot of LFAs come out, a lot of technology Sometimes, that was yeah, Me Too beautiful. come out of Barta, and when beautiful. it was first. Keep going. Uh, yeah, we're, yeah. we're keep talking. We're just we're seeing some beautiful houses up here, so yeah. we're just commenting in the background. That's where the story Little Women happened. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, good. Good. Keep going. <laughs> Sorry, taking them through a historic Concord right now. We're yeah, yeah. we're traveling yeah, through yeah. the yeah. National so, Park. So. Keep going. Oh, nice, beautiful, beautiful. When, when the uh, you know, when they made the announcement, in fact, Dave, you you sent me the first uh, link for Barda, and then that led us to that the RadX program. But it was billed as the Manhattan Project for diagnostics. Oh, and so exactly. I'm thinking, well, boy, we've got exactly that. This is a, a moonshot technology that really deserves to be explored during this pandemic. And the, the lack of, of uh, that's that's available. We can we can really make something happen here. And, and it was not, not, you know, you always think your your baby's the prettiest. So I thought we had the prettiest baby. And why wouldn't why wouldn't uh, RadX be selecting us when we see they're selecting a lot of companies? Or, or later on, we found a lot of companies that were selected. We're really doing the same basic technology over and over. Now, what Jeff said makes a lot of sense because those technologies were going to be ready sooner because they were all me too. It was really just a matter of finding the right reagents and materials and putting it onto the tried and true LFAs that have been around for decades now for the, right. for the home pregnancy testing and others. Yep. Makes it hundred percent, but it, it goes, it shows you, you know, the well-intended uh, program can be bastardized very easily. And, and if it's politicized, it really becomes something that uh, it, it's, it, it's an unfair play, uh, playing field very quickly. If, if that's the case, and it sounds like that's what happened. hundred percent, hundred percent. That's what yeah, happened. My understanding is for, for the program. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, wow. Go ahead, so, John. So uh, to, to get to the benefits of being part of the, the, the benefits of being part of this BARDA program, for us, it's been uh, really night and day from, from a company standpoint. I think I think we would have uh, continued to progress. I know we would have. Because, you know, we, we have a dedicated team and the technology really is, is compelling enough that we would have continued to be able to attract the funding that's necessary to keep the the technology moving but as you guys know funding is the you know it's a lifeblood it's, it's everything when you've got to start up and if your funds start to dry up and you start spending more time raising funds then your your company or your technology development is going to suffer and and that's one of the things that had always concerned me once we got into the barter program and we had a, a set amount of funds uh and a, and a very well crafted in fact they, they spent literally uh weeks weeks and weeks with us uh, on a uh, uh, on a weekly basis and we were working on a daily basis to, to craft this project plan and between the project plan and the available funding uh we just had a roadmap to really march forward so it's a from, from an entrepreneurial viewpoint it, it really is a, a blueprint for success uh, when you have that that combination of forward thinking before you start to spend the dime forced on you by in this case barda and, and radx 
and the assistance of, of the resources of Radex to help us craft that that plan and, and hire the right consultants and and and, uh, and, and other uh, vendors. And that made all the difference. And I think so. When you talk about the benefits of being part of the program, it's the the benefit obviously of, of getting an influx of capital uh, milestone driven is a huge benefit. But even more to the point, I think is that organization around the successful plan and really uh, forcing the issue where where a uh, uh, entrepreneur that's you know forced to somewhat uh, fly by the seat of their pants, you don't get an opportunity to really think through uh, as uh, carefully as we were forced to. What does the government get um, out of this? Do they have uh, equity in the company? Do they have margin rights on your IP? What do they get? Yeah, they, the, none of the, none of those. Nope. They, they get uh, completely access to our technology, yep. and we get a first right, completely non-dilutive. And and if all goes well, we get a first customer, being the U.S. government, that will distribute our our product for the. Uh, to the target market. Just a little contract, small contract. But, so I just want to correct myself. It was Dr. Yep. Rick Bright, a PhD in immunology. He had been the director of BARDA for over nine years and gave up a, a, an amazing career um, in, in BARDA to stand up uh, for what was right. And the integrity that just oozed out of wow. this man was incredible. So if, you, if you're looking for an interesting story, look up Rick Bright's resignation the letter that he wrote, the, the press conferences he did afterwards, and um, a real hero in the beginning of this pandemic. Um, and I, I have to say that- That's the, awesome. the team, I definitely will look that up. Yeah, and the team at Barta and Radex were amazing. Uh, we would bring companies to them to evaluate and spend time with, and, and they really did dedicate the time. What an amazing group of uh, professionals uh, coming from a, a lot of different backgrounds to uh, jumpstart this initiative in the beginning of a pandemic made me feel um, like not as helpless, but but also that that, you know, individuals can uh, contribute to uh, these large government programs. Did it make America great again? I don't know about that, but we did. You know, we did come up with a test. We did come up with the vaccines. We did, you know, the, the technology that went into it. Um, I'd love to see the scorecard of Radex after all those years and, and what what were the ones that became commercial products or how did, to, how did, to, did it relate to, um, uh, what is his name? Uh, Jared Kushner was the heading up some space shot thing of his own. Remember that? Mm, I don't think that's why he got the 2 billion from the Saudi Arabian. No, uh, <laughs> it was not that, but he, there was another rapid, <laughs> per, there was another rapid program under the uh, Trump administration that may or may not have succeeded in anything. And that was not BARDA, obviously. Which yeah. way am I going? Oh, you're just going to do a round and we're going to okay, go right back. back where we came from. Okay. This you're is where my son goes to school, by the way. Talking, oh. Speaking about innovation, this is Minuteman Technical Vocational uh-huh. Regional High School. And he's studying programming here. But what an amazing asset for these towns. Uh-huh. Uh, brand new brand new system. So, Do you recall, wow. John, do you recall the um, Jared Kushner... Um, rapid development program, which I don't know that it came up with anything, but I don't know that it didn't. I just don't remember. Do you remember that, John? Yeah, uh, well, if, I think he was on a task force or led the task force for the, the, the um, PPE, the protective equipment. Yeah, 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 that's right. Of, that's right. Uh, it seems like, the, yeah. yeah. And, and then the vaccines as well. I think there was a lot yeah, of, um, yeah. you know, successfully produced the vaccines, but there was a lot of right. give and take. Uh, before that, and yeah, I think Kushner was was sort of central to those things. And there's some stories about you know his buddies and his frat frat uh, buddies from Harvard were were all part of a cabal that that uh, decided who was going to get what that that sort of thing. No way, that so, didn't happen. Uh, you know, not to get too political. No, that, I don't believe it. Yeah, but but the interesting <laughs> thing is, well, uh, on a very positive note, this Make America Great Again. I think I think the Radex program is really a, a shining star in that regard because. It really does show, just as you were, as you were saying, Jeff, this collection of of people that were brought together for the Radex program. At least from our perspective, we've yep. only been exposed to you know a handful of people, but sure. they are just top shelf, uh, dedicated people that that are real. You know, they're leaders in their field, and they yep. they've got successes under their belt and all around innovation. You know, yep. it's all around taking something that was never in existence before and figuring out how to get it. Uh, Developed and then commercialized in a very short time frame. I want to get and, back on a medical device. So I want to get back everything to, against you. Hold on, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, John, I want to get back to Jeff's comment 
and yours. Uh, maybe the two of you can, I didn't quite, Jeff made a funny comment here about a small contract and I have to assume that was said tongue in cheek. The, facetiously. Uh, yeah, facetiously. What is it that BARDA or the US government will get? You said they'll distribute your product, but they're not gonna distribute it for free. You're gonna make money. Oh, right. What do you? What is it that you are you are you going to sell them this um, for exorbitant profits, which would be good for you? Um, how does that all work? Uh, well, uh, and, uh, no, uh, unfortunately, it won't be exorbitant profits, but there'll be uh, a first customer. Hopefully, now this is all to be you know happen in the future, and they've got to keep it as they say the yeah. stars aligning course. And but threshold. But, but in the end, the uh, the yeah, uh, in the end, the government, uh, I think, is likely to purchase our product if all continues to go well so that they can distribute it during the uh, the, the flu season and, and now it's the COVID and flu season uh, so that people that have these disabilities that, that aren't served by the conventional um, at-home test can have a solution. And so it's a small market. Yeah, yeah. So this, it, this it, is it's like a great opportunity for a, a small startup, but a large company is going to ignore it. Yeah. So this is like having a strategic partner, of, uh, but in this case, it's the government. They're strategic in the sense that they may ultimately be a customer of yours, but there are no strings attached. And unlike a typical strategic partner, they're not taking an equity or other interest. So this is in many ways the best strategic partner on the one hand, on the other hand, um, it's a tough, uh, it's a tough contest to win to get where you've gotten. It almost, it's almost too good to be true. So what am I missing? Well, they're from the government and they're here to help. So, I mean, it's, it's, it can be a slow, uh, process as well, as much oh. as they want to kickstart things and get things going. Um, it, it still does take quite a while, right? I mean, John, it, how did you find the experience in terms of expediency? Uh, very fast moving, but you're right. After after a lot of uh, qualification and vetting. Yep, that's so, right. So that's the that for us that was the challenge. First, you have to get selected for. Prepared so that your RADx team can pitch your project to the NIH for funding. So it was very careful and methodical. But again, like I said, I think it also was a huge benefit from an entrepreneurial standpoint because it, it forced us to really uh, write a work plan that thought out in this work plan. It's called the de-risking phase. So the yep. de-risking phase, which you want to do anyway, right? You want to show that your your technology uh, can be de-risked before you look for the substantial money. Well, well, that was the same way that they've set up the Radex program, at least at least for our perspective. They, they are first putting us through the six-month the risking uh, program, which we hopefully will successfully complete in the next month or so, before they move you on to the commercialization or the scalable manufacturing and, and regulatory phase, with, which is going to consume more dollars because it's a much larger uh, uh, project to run. That's right. Okay. And your comment, where did the go? Yeah. So did you did you find anything? It's very methodical yeah. and slow, yeah. but I, I didn't get the feeling, and I've worked with large pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. Still record because he's connected. Yeah. I don't know if I lost you guys. By no, you're, you're good. Keep going. Keep going, John. Sorry. My we're here. Thank you. We're hoping Microsoft. We're hoping okay. that yeah, during these stretches, Microsoft will get this. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I think they will. Yeah. I think they will. Keep going, John. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, what, what was the? What, where else do you want me to oh, go? Oh, okay. so, no. I, I guess. The, I guess the, the question uh, was: were, were there any? signs or symptoms of, of the uh, bureaucracy that is our government um, slowing things down at all? Or did you feel like they were able to keep pace and you set the tempo? Uh, yeah, uh, the, that's, I, I never looked at it from that thought. And no, this, this I, didn't, I don't think we've gotten anything that has slowed us down other than a, a very careful vetting process and then a very methodical uh, work plan generating uh, process, what, what as they call it, the deep dive. Yep. Uh, after that, it was really as fast as we can move. They've been supporting us, and also a lot of flexibility, at least for us. And I think part of it is because we've, we've been successful hitting our targets, but uh, we're, we're at such an aggressive uh, 
technology development stage that they're very understanding. Yep, understood. You know, the extensions from the data over time, but text data and let's keep saying to us, we, we need objective data. It shows the objective data. They, I won't take your word for it, of course. You've got to show it very conclusively from the standpoint of, of uh, data that you can you can measure, right? Yeah, absolutely. What will happen when you've got, uh, will this thing require FDA approvals? And if so, what sort of clinical studies or studies will you have to do? And how willing are they to, um, they being BARDA, to help fund those or help get you in the door and sort of out the door again in the end? The, the phase two of the uh, Radix program we're in is, is uh, one of the outputs is FDA submission or regulatory submission so that they definitely will support us with clinical trials and you know what's required for us to get to that submission. Uh, really our, our <laughs> Our current challenge, if you can call it that, I guess it is a challenge because we're, we're trying to get our technology to the point where we can submit regulatory submission while there's still an emergency use authorization available because it significantly lowers the, the bar for us as far as clinical trials and, and the data that you need to present. You, you still need to be ready for the conventional regulatory approval, but with the EUA, it's, it's a lower bar to get through that uh, that regulatory review process so you can market and sell your product. Uh, and it's still available, even though you know, the administration has said that the, basically COVID is over for, for us. Uh, they still recognize that uh, the EUAs are still important because the, the, especially from our perspective as a diagnostic company, the, the, the testing devices still need to get out there and, and they're still supporting it with that EUA status. So at this point, are, are we, you know, is, is it going to have, I don't want to say an impact, but is it going to, are we doing this for the next pandemic? Are we doing this, this for the next problem? Is that the, the investment here? Or is this, no, or is this for, I mean, COVID is going to be endemic, right? It's going to be here for a long time. We're always going to need these tests. And then uh, follow up that with um, my brain keeps thinking about the cost of this, right? Is this, you know, how much does this add to the cost? Is it basically like paying for a mask and a, and a lateral flow assay test? Um, what What's the cost per unit or the intended cost, I should say? Yeah, I, uh, it, it broke up a bit, but uh, the, we expect our cost uh, for the, this product that's built for the accessibility. So we have some added uh, electronic uh, cost uh, a speaker, for example, is, is relatively expensive, and yep. and a voice module because that's how our, our interface works. Yep. So, so the cost is uh, going to be about ten to twelve dollars for our our cost to make the product, uh, mm. and then when we can strip away for other use cases, the the expense of the speaker and and the audio components, uh, we can we're projecting we can get the cost down to about seven dollars or, or lower, and, and that gets us cost competitive with, with other testing devices. But for this niche market, they need a little bit more than, you know, than the simplest of the uh, minimalist construction, and that's where the added costs come from. Let's go to that. Uh, that, but, that but, uh, will, your, will your mask for the $7 or the $10? Oh, no, that's the cost. That's their bomb. That's uh, their, no, yeah. yeah, right. Well, yeah, yeah I'm sorry. Yes. So, it, it doesn't matter whether it's your yeah. cost. Yeah. It'll go out. You'll yeah. market it for much more, but that's a different issue. But does the mask you have in mind um, actually produce result, or does it merely collect sample? No, no, it's self-contained, produces the test result. Yeah. And what do you walk around if you put the mask on? Uh, say, say these things become uh, well known, and we start seeing them in the in the the, the tea or the, the the grocery store or the subway system up here in Boston. Well, and people are wearing these these uh, duck bill things. Will the end of it turn yellow? Like, oh, that person's got COVID, or that person's got tuberculosis. tuberculosis. <laughs> so it'll be like a little visual indicator to everybody else Isolate. to stay away. Isolate. Yeah, <laughs> stay. Well, <laughs> yeah. What's what's gonna look? A little red yeah. light. What's gonna happen? What's coming out of that speaker? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Caution. Danger, Will Robinson, danger. Interface. Pardon? I, Say again? So, so, yeah, you're asking about the user interface. And, of yep. course, as I mentioned, we have a direct electrical signal. That means we've got a digital signal that we can 
transmit wirelessly, for example, use a cell phone as the interface, uh, or we can send it off through with using the cell phone again as a relay to to uh, to a collection uh, on the internet to a server, uh, and then you can uh, collect a lot of information from a lot of people and then start doing analysis on that, those big data sets. Uh, the spoken word interface that we're that we're we've developed now for the accessibility market. Uh, our expectation is that it'll be used at home uh, by people with low vision or, or elderly or, or blind people, and typically they'll be in a quiet setting. So we, you know, we put our volume at the right level for for that use case. It's not something that you'll be seeing people wear on the subway and hear, you know, a, 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 an audible announcement that they've got COVID. <laughs> so but, but with the flexibility, I mean, yeah. We can make that interface as simple or as, as uh, complex or as feature full as as needed or as the application warrants. So that gives us a lot of flexibility in our cost structure as well because it, the interface is, is the costly part right now. The really? the biosensor is surprisingly uh, not that much money. The detection electronics are, are very straightforward. There's nothing exotic. Uh, and that's, you know, there's thousands of, of companies around the world that can manufacture the electronics, so there's no specialty there. The collection system, uh, as we worked our way through this, the risk and phase, we really just kept making it simpler, kept getting the, the materials uh, to where they need to be. And, and ideally, uh, for the production that we're looking at, which is uh, reel to reel or roll to roll production, you want to start out with flat materials, and we've been able to achieve that. So. Uh, you know, everything is conspiring for a low-cost disposable device uh, without uh, uh, too much expense. How, and how small, choose, for how example, small, with a, can you make this, yeah. um, I don't know what you call an ear ring that goes in the nose, so I'm going to call it a nose ring, um, but can you make this ultimately a small part? Is that yeah, yeah, I think so. A nose ring. Could you make this as small as a little nose ring or a little uh, micro dot that goes on the nose? Wow. Like Rudolph, Rudolph the I, Red I Nose Ring. It's very could, fashion yeah, forward. Uh, yeah. I, I think we could, Dave. That's a, that's a cool looking, uh, cool, cool concept there. I think we could. Yeah, I don't see why we couldn't. The, the, there's not much, uh, you know, usually a battery is what you have to worry about, right? And, and there's not much. Well, now uh, we're going to have to scrub uh, this and, and put it in the claims. For, for but... <laughs> well, I think what I had in yeah. mind was there was a time, John, you might recall, <clears throat> early in COVID, companies were advertising, um, oh, what do you call a card that you would wear on your side that indicated your COVID status and it, when, when you passed other people in your, your company, somehow the two cards would communicate and I don't know what they did. Maybe they told you to stand back Will Robinson or whatever with COVID people, but I can imagine everyone wearing little nose rings um, with their various health statuses and you know, the, the ring would be green, which is you can get close, yellow, which is, well, keep like three feet or red, which is make it six feet or further, buddy. Highly infectious, Debbie. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is an interesting time to be developing this technology because things are moving so quickly and, and also the healthcare systems are becoming or have become very receptive to what is very logical, keeping yep. people home, remote patient monitoring, you know, not bringing somebody to an emergency room uh, because they, they had a stroke, but trying to look for the symptoms pre-stroke and, and have some intervention at the doctor's office that you can schedule. Yep. All of these are happening, and they're happening because of the infrastructure that exists, the wireless network, the internet, and, and the ability to communicate with all, all kinds of uh, email, texts, and all kinds of way of signaling information. Uh, to medical providers and, and your doctors and collect that information. It's all happening at once. It's. I think it's been possible for probably a decade now, but uh, but the pandemic really created this this um, force of nature now, where the healthcare systems throughout the world are, are realizing the value of remote patient monitoring and keeping patients at home if you can. And so now the insurance companies, I think, are going to, are going to start picking up on on this as well. That it's better to be proactive instead of spending you know two hundred thousand dollars on a reactive. Uh, heart attack, you, you spend $20 or, or something or a couple of hundred dollars on a proactive test to see if somebody might be or, or uh, heading towards a heart to be instead of waiting for the for the event to happen for the tragedy. Yeah, that's, that's right. Um, it, it's interesting you mentioned that, John. I, I uh, 
recently had a chance to meet um, at the Canadian consulate, Susan Moffat Bruce. She's the new president of uh, Leahy Health. And um, she was talking about their new program that they have, which is called uh, Hospital at Home. And they benchmarked a couple programs around the country, but they were, you know, getting patients to come in and because they're overbooked or they just don't have any room, they would send them home with a vehicle that would set up a hospital room in their house and they would track and remote patient monitor those patients for things like, you know, congestive heart failure or stroke or other things so that they could, or maybe even just simpler things, but so that they could, um, you know, spend their time um, caring for those patients. And they originally set up the program and said, you know what, we'll probably do 30 in the first year um, and just see how it works out. And they did 90 in the first quarter, 90 patients wow. that they were able to send home. So um, they really are thinking about you know, how do we reduce wow. the cost, but also uh, impact the, the footprint and the patients that we can can help. Right. Well, so I thought that was really interesting. I think in light of the uh, right. in light of the uh, New Hampshire primary yesterday, we can suggest to the Democrats or to Biden, particularly that he have hats that are not red, but blue that don't say MAGA, but say MIGA or MIGA make innovation great again. How's oh, there that? you go. There, there we go. go. Make innovation great again. What do you think, John? Print it. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that at all. But uh, yeah. Um. Well, you want to bring this to a close? It's <laughs> we're, we're, we're at we're two thirty ish. Yeah, I think this has been great, John. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Uh, there's so many, uh, so many inspiring stories like yours. Um, you have a really strong why, and I'm sure that your dad would be proud of the work that you've done during this pandemic to to make a difference. Um, I think that that it's important to recognize how these programs. Uh, benefit startup companies and help them get off the ground. Um, and then, you know, thank you for advocating uh, for, for how these programs can help other entrepreneurs uh, in the biotech space. I had, a, I had a simpler thought. Why don't we have him as a guest again and we don't have to do anything but drive around because he, he talks so much. He did. He covered a lot of ground. Yeah, but we don't uh, have to say anything. <laughs>